Saturday. Any birthdays? Janet goes, look at that. Isn't that sweet? And I said, well, why do you think they're holding hands? She goes, well, they've been married so long they love each other. I said, no. I said, that way neither one of them will get lost getting out of the restaurant. <laughs> Won't be long they'll have one of those ropes tied to each other, right? Dip the kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you out this morning. Let's stand this morning, give you a chance to greet one another, turn to someone, tell them you're glad to see them in the Lord's house today.
given that promise from God. Every time it reminds me of his promises, and he is a good God, and he's never broken one. Can I get an amen? Good to see you in the Lord's house today. We come to worship him. Uh, we are not the biggest church in the area, certainly not the most the nicest church in the area, not talking about the people, but as far as looks and what we have in buildings. But when we come here, we come with the intention that God's going to meet us in this place. I think a lot, sometimes that's dangerous. My wife's not here right now to testify to that. But I was thinking yesterday as we were driving back from visiting our grandson, it's amazing that God can be everywhere at one time. I was thinking they're worshiping God down here and over here and out there. And God wants to be in all those places. I want him to be here. I want him to be here. That's why we come today. Let's bow our heads in prayer and invite God into this place. Take a moment if there's anything that might prevent you and hinder you from worshiping. You ask God to take care of that. All right. Heavenly Father. We know you always hear us when we pray. We thank you that you're that good of a God. We come to this time that we've set aside just a brief window on this new day to worship you and we invite you into this place. Lord, we want to feel you in our hearts. We want to experience you as the word goes forth and demonstrate you in the power of the Spirit. And we want to leave here knowing that we've been with you and we worship you in spirit and in truth. That's most important. God, every thought, every word, and you get honor and glory in Jesus' name. And all his people said, amen. Thank you all. Be seated this morning. How about number 706 in your hymn book? Number 706. Thank you so much. where you can worship him. Number 706, sing with me a song about Jesus. Ready? Here we go.
Number 456. Number Everywhere 
that we go. Lord, I pray that you would be with us here today. Help us, Father, to worship you. Help us to see you for who you are and to see ourselves for who we are, Lord. We love you so much because of what you've done for us, because of the salvation that you provided for us, and because of the care that you give us every day. Lord, rest for the all as he preaches. Give him the words that you would have him say in part of me. Fill him with the Spirit and give him the voice to proclaim the message here today. I pray you just make the hearts of those of us who are here today tender that we respond to your word in the way that you need us to follow. And if there's somebody here who doesn't know you, that Lord, you will especially draw them. Forgive us where we fail you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. If you have a youngster, first grade and under, first grade and under, that would like to go to children's worship, I see part of the kids up back there. Y'all will follow me home. Tax-free weekend. I'm assuming that, that took some of that just out of church. I don't know. Oh, they don't charge taxes here. They don't, they don't do anything except pass the place. They don't make you do anything. Now, Ron and Mary will, but I don't. Good to see you this morning. We had a busy week. Uh, all last weekend was busy. We had a funeral Saturday for family. A visitation Sunday afternoon, and then this worker brother's going to thank you. And then I preached at Graveside on Monday. I had Tuesday and Wednesday to get ready for the rest of the week, and we were gone. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we spent the weekend, or those days, with our grandsons, and we don't get to see the twins are 12, and the little one's 10 going on 18. And uh, boy's a smart kid, I'm telling you. Don't argue with him, he'll be right, I'm telling you. But anyway, we got home and we were exhausted. But there are reasons for that because we're not young anymore. I spent the early part of the week determining what the Lord would have me preach, and on the way home, I started changing direction, and I hate it when that happens, especially when I don't have enough time to really prepare. So last night, God and I came to an agreement, and I hope, I hope we're on the same page. But I'm going to read a passage this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 18. And I'm going to preach a sermon that I really don't want to preach, but the Lord led me to it. I'll tell you what it's about, and then I can tell by the expression on your face, if you make an expression, whether or not you're going to like it. The title of the sermon is, What Jesus Taught About Forgiveness. Ooh, I heard some people go, ooh. If I'm here at 18, that's the way I heard that. <laughs> Let me begin with just giving you what I would call some pointed statements, all right? Just some things make you think. Have you ever said... Or heard someone else say, I just can't forgive him or her. Ever heard somebody say that? I've heard people say that a lot. I've had people sit across my desk in a counseling session, and, and their life was in shambles, and they related it back to an inability in their mind to forgive someone. Here's another one. See, I've already made her mad. <laughs> Have you ever heard someone say or maybe said to yourself, I would forgive them, but they never asked? You know that? You know, I, I hear people say, oh, well, I forgive them, they never asked me to forgive them, so I'm not going to forgive them because I don't have to forgive them unless they ask me to forgive them. You hear that a lot. And here's a good one. I would forgive them, 
but they don't deserve it. Well, it got quiet while I said that. Well, as we read this text, we're going to see some comparison contrast. Did I jump ahead of you, Joel? Don't worry about it, all right? We're going to see in this story that Jesus told, we're going to see the contrast between anger and compassion. I don't know if you're aware of this, but an unwillingness to forgive someone is rooted in anger. And we're going to see the difference between anger and compassion. We're going to see the comparison contrast between someone who has put themselves into a prison and someone who has released themselves from the bondage of unforgiveness. You liking the sermon so far, you don't have to lie about it, all right? We're going to see, boy, I tell you what, sometimes I preach to myself on this one, all right? We're going to see the comparison and contrast between revenge, that is the desire to get even. Let's say that with me. The desire to get even. Some of y'all didn't say it as wickedly as I did because you ain't never been there. All right? So the, the contrast between revenge and forgiveness. So let's see what Jesus said. Matthew 18, we'll start reading in verse 21. I won't tell you everything that happened before, but Matthew kind of jumps around, all right? So Peter came to him. Peter did that often. And he wanted to talk to Jesus privately. And he always had something in mind. And, and, and in my mind, Simon Peter's desire was to build up Simon Peter. And you can really see that in this conversation and in the opening line there. All right, let's keep going. So Jesus, uh, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother's sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Now listen. Under the, 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 the Judaistic uh, traditions, it wasn't necessarily in their law, but you were required under their traditions to forgive someone three times. So Simon Peter is coming and saying, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother who trespasses against me? Seven times? So I think you can see he's building himself up and he wants to seem probably more spiritual than he is in his carnal ways. And I've told you before, I identify with him, excuse me, more than any of the other apostles. So I like Jesus' reply. So Jesus said unto him, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now you know in the, in the biblical culture, Seven is the perfect number. It is the number of completion. And to say 70 times 7 means to keep on and on and on into eternity or until eternity comes, forgiving someone. I bet that melted Simon Peter down a little bit, all right? And then Jesus told this, this parable. It doesn't say it's a parable. But it's a comparison. So therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take into account his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, by the way, that's a mathematical term. He's balancing the books. He's seeing what people owe him. One was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. I, I have read that if we had a number that would compare to what 10,000 talents represented, and he's referring to talents of gold, it would be what we would call a gazillion. All right? I don't know what the national debt is, but it's in billions and probably trillions now, and we just keep spending money we don't have. All right? Well, evidently, this guy had the same problem. All right? He was indebted. To this, this, he'd become his master because he was in servitude to him for what he owed. But for as much as he had not to pay, 
his Lord, the Master, commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children all he had in payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Ain't no way. You owe somebody a gazillion dollars. You can work all your life. You can work 24-7, and you're never going to pay it all back. But that was his intention, and that was the set of his heart. And the Lord of that servant was moved, verse 27, was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But this servant, same guy, went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred pence. We're talking pennies to dollars, all right? He owed him he owed him nothing. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you off. And he would not allow that, but he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. By the way, what kind of grabs you about that? How are you going to pay the debt if you're in jail? You might do a little work and get paid in jail, but you're not going to get paid enough to pay the debt. That didn't make sense. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he called him and said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt, that debt, because you desire and ask me, shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due. I don't know who the tormentors are for sure, but I got an idea. If you've ever had a debt that went into collection, they're the tormentors. <laughs> And it wasn't even my fault I co-signed on something, all right? So likewise shall my, here's the, here's the key to this whole thing. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. May God bless his word. I want to read those last few words of the last verse again. If you, from your hearts, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. I want to tell you, first of all, that forgiveness is not natural to humanity. People talk all the time about Cain and Abel. First two sons of Adam and Eve, and they rose up with jealousy. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. I hear people say all the time, well, you know, I'm the way I am because I come from a dysfunctional family. We all come from a dysfunctional family. Our first family, Adam and Eve, they were pretty dysfunctional. So it's in our genetics, and it's in our makeup, and it's not natural, by and large, to find people who are willing to forgive. There's another thought that goes with that. Listen, forgiveness is not an act of our emotion. It's an act of our will. If we forgive someone, we make a cognizant choice. Oftentimes, we have to think it through. And we make the choice to forgive them. Forgiveness is a choice. Say that with me. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness emulates God. We are never more like God than we are when we're forgiving someone who's wronged us. Right. That's his nature. That's his character. Forgiveness reflects the character of God. Forgiveness is not natural. It's supernatural. 
it's supernatural. We have to rely on God in order to forgive someone. Well, that was the introduction. I want to talk under four headings. I'll talk quick. I want you to listen quick. I want to talk about the measure of forgiveness. So Peter came to Jesus in verse 21 and 22. And I told you Jewish tradition taught three times, and he said, how about seven times? And he's showing generosity and trying to show how spiritual minded he is. And so Jesus speaks of this innumerable, immeasurable number. It's not 497 times seven. So for all practical purposes, he's saying you just keep on and on and on and on forgiving someone who's wronged you. Does that sound easy? Well, it doesn't sound easy to me. I'm about a one time or after one time of forgiving someone, and I will tell you it's my next after I've forgiven them, I've still got my eyes on them. <laughs> Y'all like that? Can I see your hands, please? All right, we're gonna open the altar up in a little while. <laughs> I like what first Corinthians chapter 13, that's the love chapter, the charity chapter, and it says, it does not keep record of evil that is done against us in verse number five. It doesn't keep score. You know, I'll tell you something. Listen, listen, look at me. That's what's wrong in a lot of marriages today is because the husband and wife are keeping score against one another. Yeah. There might have been a story this husband and wife went to the marriage counselor. They were having problems. And the counselor was kind of getting acquainted with them and finding out what was going on. And, uh, and, and, and he said, well, sometimes, you know, we have an argument. And the counselor said, does your wife get hysterical? And he said, no, she gets historical. And he said, what do you mean? He said, she ain't never forgotten nothing. Like that. Well, I can tell you, in my household, it's not Becky that is historical. I have never forgotten anything that somebody's done to me, all right? I've got a catalog. I've got a file. I know where to go to find it. That ain't right. And I'm working on it. But love don't keep score. If we've forgiven a brother seven times, by that time, we are in the habit of forgiveness. So that's the measure of it. Let's talk about the merciful forgiver. So here's this guy, and he owes his Lord. That's what he's called in the Bible. So obviously he has power and authority over him. How he was able to get in debt that much, I'll never know. And I'll just stop and say this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ today. Be careful about debt. Debt can get you into trouble. Now, I'll tell you, it's not debt that gets you into trouble. It's not paying your bills that gets you into trouble. So don't borrow more than you're able to pay. That makes sense. And, and as we were raising our children, when they got a certain age, we, we took them and helped them buy a car, took a loan out in our name and their name, and said, look, as long as you pay your payments, it's yours. But our name's on there, too. And if you quit making the payments, and we have to make the payment, it's ours then. You get that? And you're not driving one of our cars. But it taught him a good lesson. I remember when I was young, my dad told me, he said, son, you can have anything you want if you'll pay your bill. I don't know why I said that today, but evidently somebody, those of you who are listening on Facebook Live and needed to hear that, God bless you and tidings. I wasn't talking to you all, all right? 10,000 talents of that day would have taken a man 20 years of hard work to earn one talent. I didn't know that. Just researching this. It would have taken a man hard work 20 years to earn one talent. In today's terms of buying power, it's equivalent to millions, millions of dollars. Uh, the talent was the highest known denomination of currency in ancient Roman Empire, and 10,000 was the highest number for which the Greek language had a word. So there you go. There you go. The NIV margin, and if you have an NIV Bible in the margin, that's where it says that it compares to a gazillion. So what's, what's Jesus' point? The number is so vast, so countless, so incalculable, it's an unpayable debt, 
And it represents, listen to me, look at me, if you don't hear anything else to say in here, it, it represents the debt, the sin debt we owed that we could not, nor can anyone ever pay. You can't do enough good to overcome the debt you owe. Praise God, he paid the debt he did not owe because I owed the debt I could not pay. Ezra in chapter 9, I just got through listening to the book of Ezra and now me and I and now I'm in Esther. Boy, I love Esther. It's a great story. Ezra 9, 6 said, And I said, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our head and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Ezra, that old priest, he had it down where he stood before God. And the nation of Israel too. Well, that was the debt, the demand. He came and said, pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. At this point, the Lord, the master, he showed no mercy whatsoever. He said, you're going to pay me what you owe me, or I'm going to throw you into prison. And, and I don't know, some people think that maybe he got caught embezzling, stealing. Nobody knows for sure, but he was mad, he was angry. So he says, you're going to do this. And he says, you're going to jail, you're going to prison. And in his desperation, listen, because this is a picture of getting saved. In his desperation and humiliation, he throws himself at the mercy of the master. Amen. Folks, that's the only way anybody ever gets saved. You won't come to him and bargain with him and say, God, if you'll do this, I'm able to do this. God doesn't need your help and salvation. If God needed your help and salvation, Jesus died in vain. So in desperation, he comes guilty, condemned, death, devastated, genuinely repentant, and throws himself in his mercy, and he humbly confesses his sins. I love the Beatitudes in, in, in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And it's not a way to salvation. Jesus is the way, all right? But it shows us a person coming to Christ. And it says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Listen. For you to get saved, you've got to realize that you're spiritually bankrupt. You can't pay. You never do enough. Let me see him forgiving this debt. This still, well, I know Jesus was telling a story, and sometimes Jesus used exaggeration to make his point. Sometimes we preachers do the same thing, because remember Jesus was one too, all right? So he forgave the debt. He didn't deserve it. He could never possibly earn it. The master just said, I'm forgiving your debt. I'll compare this to verse in Ephesians chapter number 4, verse 32. It says, Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Let's talk about the merciless. Unforgiving. So immediately, how could this happen after he'd been forgiven so much and immediately he goes out and finds some guy that owes him literally nothing, a minuscule amount, and he grabs him and he says, pay me what you owe me. And he said, I can't pay you, but I promise you I will. And he said, no, you won't. I'm going to throw you in jail. He's just been forgiven a debt he could never pay. And he's unwilling to forgive someone who has wronged him. Jesus was not teaching that sins against fellow believers or anyone else is insignificant, but they are minute compared to what? He's forgiven everyone in the whole world who will come ask for him. He doesn't compare. He doesn't compare. So, Two factors here. The first man was much further removed from the king in the pecking order 
than he was from the other servants. So they, they, were, they were on the same plane. They both owed the debt. One owed the debt to the master, one owed the debt to the master who was on the same level with him. This behavior seems almost unthinkable to me. And that's why Jesus told the story, all right? But he wants us to know, listen, but here's the point. For Christians to be unwilling to forgive someone, a brother or sister who has wronged them is not right. And you're not acting like Jesus when you refuse to do that. Amen. Listen, I, I'm going to say something today, and if, if it bothers you, you come apologize to me later, all right? There are examples in our own church where people are unwilling to forgive one another. You say, well, that's none of your business, preacher. Oh, it's my business. You want to know why it's my business? Because I get up here and preach every Sunday, and I know when the Holy Spirit's been quenched. And when you come with a chip on your shoulder and you're unwilling to forgive someone, you don't just affect you. You might affect that person who's sitting there not saved and the Holy Spirit can't work because he won't hang around in an atmosphere like that. Now, I know it's true in other churches. It's true. I'm sure it's true in all churches. I just got the guts to point it out. Now, I didn't expect a lot of amen, but I know <laughs> Let's talk about the message of forgiveness. The sin of unforgiveness exaggerated in the believer because he has more for which to be forgiven than the person who's not saved. I like what verse 31 says. Uh, we didn't read it. 21. 31. So when his fellow servant saw what he was done, they were very sorry. They were deeply grieved at that person. You know the point there, don't you? There are other people watching us. There are other people watching what we do. There are other people watching our attitude. There are other people want to know how it is between us. They're watching. And they know. Verse number 34, he said he's going to put him in prison to be tortured. That's what forgiveness means. Most of you sitting here today have been saved. You've been forgiven. You couldn't do anything for it. All you had to do was ask. The forgiveness had already been granted. Because of his grace. It's an act of grace. And when you forgive someone who's wronged you, and no doubt you've been wrong, you're not doing that for them. You're doing it for you in your relationship with God. Those of you who know me well, some of y'all know me since I was 29 years old. And know that this is not my nature. I've carried around a burden of unforgiveness for a long time. I've done that twice in my life. I was angry. I was hurt. I was deeply, deeply offended. Now I'll tell you, I said, or you, don't, you probably don't want to hear this from your preacher, but you know me most of you anyway. I'm going to tell you anyway, all right? I sat around thinking about ways I could get even and not get caught. That's Christian, ain't it? And listen, here's why I tell you this. If you're not careful, unforgiveness will morph into bitterness. And when you get bitter, you're in bad place. And I'll never forget the day that I fell on my face somewhere out in the woods by myself and I said, God, you're going to have to help me forgive. It's like a burden in today. They never called me and said, could you forgive me? They never said, I know I've wronged you. They never said, I could never pay back for what I've done. 
But it wasn't about me. It was about me. My relationship. Betty made it to both of us. Our musicians are going to come and we're going to sing a song. And our, our altar is open for people to come pray. And if you come pray this morning, I don't want you to think, well, if I go up there and pray, you put the people in the I'll come up here and be praying and focus on them. One night I preached at the church camp years and years ago. If you're an invitation and I've given an invitation about like what I'm doing now, I'm standing up on the podium. And this lady comes and kneels in this thought of right ahead of me and steps and all the way across the stage. And I, I wasn't trying to listen, but she started praying. And she was moaning and groaning. And no words were coming out of her mouth. And my heart went out to her, but this was between her and God. And so I didn't intervene and I didn't interfere. But a verse came to mind from the book of Romans. When we don't know what to pray sometimes, God the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be done. Come lay that burden down today. If you hear me not say, come down this altar and ask God to forgive you your sin and be your Savior. He won't turn you away. Father, have your will now. Help us to be submissive to you and your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Always sing what? Uh -huh.